Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him, and He will direct your paths. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not grow weary. They shall walk and not faint. Fear thou not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee, yea, I will help thee. Yea, I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God, and the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, shall defend your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee, because he trusteth in thee. For the grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God shall stand forever. Before we get started tonight, we need to make sure we're in fellowship, so we'll have a few moments of silent prayer after we go through some of the opening uh, cont- current events that I'll talk about. We might have to do this all over again, but so we'll just have to watch our mental attitudes. Have a few moments of silent prayer, then I'll open in prayer. Let's pray. Father, we're indeed grateful that we have your word to go to because your word is a sure and certain guide to us. It is the uh, standard that we should go to to understand truth. It is a source of truth, and it's the framework by which we are to understand and analyze everything in history. And so the very basic thing that we need to do in life is to uh, come to an understanding of your word and let that shape our, the, the framework of our thought. Father, as we continue our study in Hebrews tonight, we pray that we might be again encouraged with your, the scope of your plan, the future uh, destiny that you have for Israel in the Millennial Kingdom and the future role that you have for us as believer priests who will be uh, reigning and serving as priests within the uh, administration of that kingdom in the future. Now, Father, we pray that you challenge us with the things we study in your word Give us clarity of thought. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Well, this morning when I woke up and was fixing breakfast, watching Fox News, I was hit with a, an interesting announcement that they had on Fox News. And it's been the tradition at West Houston Bible Church to always have the very uh, best cutting-edge Bible teachers in America. And so I was amazed to discover that this Roman Catholic priest this in uh, Chicago yesterday announced that the Reverend Jeremiah Wright was the best Bible teacher in America. So I was wondering if we ought to have him come to West Houston Bible Church. <laughs> you know, I think the very worst first year failure at Dallas Seminary is a better Bible teacher than Jeremiah Wright ever thought he would be. And it is just amazing how this country has shifted to where people can think that that is Bible teaching. There's nothing in liberation theology that is consistent, whether it's black liberation theology or Latin American liberation theology. There's nothing in in liberation theology that is consistent with the Bible. And there's nothing in liberation theology that a Bible-believing Christian should be comfortable with. It is a total distortion of the problem. It's a total distortion of the solution. And it is an interpretation of the Bible that is purely Marxist and socialist. And it has nothing to do with sin and redemption, the glories of God's grace. And anyone who is attracted to that kind of a teaching uh, is in the deepest form of backsliding and rejection of truth that you can possibly, possibly imagine. And the thing is that the people who sit under that kind of teaching, whoever they may be, are going to be influenced by that. In the same way that those of you who sit under my teaching are influenced by what I teach. And I can t- tell you that if you sit under my teaching for five years, I can almost uh, almost 100% tell you what your views are on economics, politics, and social issues. And because that, for you, that will flow out of what you hear the Bible teach. And the same thing is true for people who sit in any other kind of congregation in America. You listen to a pastor, and that pastor's message influences how people think about social issues, politics, economics, because ultimately the Bible applies to every area of human thinking. And unless your brain cells don't connect whatsoever, and they only have a 
uh, rare acquaintance with one another and wave at a distance maybe once every 10 or 12 years, uh, you just can't, you, you, you can't sit there. And so this is just a slap in the face to every Bible-believing Christian. What an assault that we had this, from, from that particular Roman Catholic priest. Of course, that reflects his own lack of biblical training. As I pointed out the other night, I think I made a comment on this sometime recently, that when I was a, a student at, at a University of St. Thomas, of course, <clears throat> there were uh, always uh, one or two nuns that were taking classes uh, with us in the philosophy department there, and we would get in interesting discussions. There was another Dallas Seminary grad in the program also, and we would get in some interesting discussions, and whenever I'd try to relate something to the Bible, the response I'd get from this one nun was, was she'd kind of jokingly say, well, you know, you can't go to the Bible with us because we're Catholics. We don't, we're Roman Catholics. We don't ever read the Bible. So that's just, that, that's how I understand that position. So that's the first contemporary issue this morning. Second issue that comes up is that occasionally we've had speakers and we've had um, things that have come up in relationship to the Chafer Seminary Conference the past couple of years and some of the other things that have gone on. And in, every now and then people hear a speaker from this pulpit say something that they, they sort of wiggle their ears about or they raise an eyebrow over and they'll come up and ask me questions. And one of the things that I sort of warned people about uh, prior to this last winter is you know, we have to treat people with a certain measure of grace and every now and then you're going to hear this. And you'll hear it from people, shoot, I say things that... Five years from now, I may go back and go, well, I don't believe that anymore because yeah, everybody changes and everybody grows. But one of the things that Arnold taught when he was here that uh, <clears throat> generated several questions, and he said the same thing when he was at Preston City Bible Church when I had him up there several years ago. That's how I knew about it and got the same questions. He made the comment that uh, the virgin birth was not designed to block the transmission of uh, Adam's original sin to Jesus. It was purely a sign, a miracle uh, designed by God to give evidence of the messianic character uh, of Jesus Christ. And in making that statement, which I don't agree with, in making that statement, he also made the comment that this doctrine was was first taught by a um, radio Bible teacher back in the uh, back in the forties. Well, the day as I was uh, preparing for class on Monday night, the History of Doctrine class, where we're going through uh, the Doctrine of the Atonement, a very important uh, study, I ran across this particular quote from Gregory I, known as Gregory the Great, the first, the one Protestants think is the first real pope in the Roman Catholic Church, and his dates are at the end of the 6th century from roughly about 570 to 604. And in his writing about the atonement, he makes this statement that I have up on the screen. And what's important is the last sentence, but I want to I want to set it up with the previous part. He talks about about the atonement, and he I correctly identifies the problem with man. See, that's the real issue in understanding the atonement: is if you don't understand man's problem correctly, of sin and guilt, that man is 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 spiritually dead then you're, you're going to misidentify the nature of the atonement. Because if man's spiritually dead, he doesn't need a, a substitutionary penal uh, atonement. But if he's just spiritually sick, then he needs a moral influence or something like that. So the issue is guilt. We are guilty of Adam's original sin. So Gregory wrote, guilt can be extinguished only by a penal offering to justice. What a fabulous statement on propitiation and the nature of the atonement. But it would contradict the idea of justice if, for the sin of a rational being like man, the death of an irrational animal should be accepted as a sufficient atonement. In other words, animal sacrifices can't atone for human guilt. Hence, a man must be offered as the sacrifice for man, so that a rational victim may be slain for a rational criminal. But how could a man, himself stained with sin, that's corruption, Stained with sin, be an offering for sin. Hence, a sinless man must be offered. But what man, descending in the ordinary course, that's normal human procreation if you didn't figure that out, but what man, descending in the ordinary course, would be free from sin? Hence, the Son of God 
must be born of a virgin and become man for us. Clear statement, six, approximately 600 A.D., that the purpose for the virgin birth was to block the perpetuation of Adam's guilt and Adam's original sin uh, and the assigning of that uh, to Jesus Christ. So uh, that is an indication this did not originate in, 19, in the 1940s. Now for the third current event. This is one that uh, it has got a little background. That background is that in the, back in the early 80s, Zane Hodges wrote a fabulous book, a, 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 a book that really caught people's attention, generated a lot of controversy, called The Gospel Under, Under Siege. Those that didn't agree with him, I thought that the title was poorly punctuated. It should, be, should have been punctuated, The Gospel Under Siege by Zane Hodges. But um, that really gave people a real understanding of what the issues were between a true free grace gospel versus what has come to be called, or what was even known then, as lordship salvation. And it really woke a lot of people up as to what the key passages were that were at the center of the debate and, and what the issues were. And there have been, I would say, thousands, tens of thousands of people who have been positively impacted by his ministry and by the ministry of of the organization that developed around him called the Grace Evangelical Society. And they have produced a journal for the last, uh, I know, at least 18, maybe uh, 20 years called the Journal of the Grace Evangelical Society, as well as a bi-monthly newsletter that comes out called Grace in Focus. And they have been very instrumental in my understanding of the issues related to numerous problem passages on the gospel and in the lives of many others. But in the last few years, they have begun to emphasize an aspect of the gospel that I cannot and do not agree with, and many others who have been members of the Grace Evangelical Society uh, do not and cannot uh, agree with. And we saw a glimpse of this debate two years ago at the uh, Chafer Seminary, Seminary Conference when uh, John Nimala, who was teaching for the seminary at the time and who it follows in lockstep with the GES position, um, delivered a paper arguing that if a person does not understand that he is getting eternal life in the sense of a life that cannot be lost, then he is not saved. And what they are fundamentally arguing for is that a, a, a faith in the gospel is essentially accepting the free gift of eternal life from Jesus. And you don't necessarily have to believe that Christ died on the cross for your sins. You, 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 in other words, if I'm witnessing to somebody and I simply tell them Jesus died for your sins so that you can have forgiveness from God, then that's an insufficient gospel. Because for them the issue is accepting the free gift of eternal life from Jesus, and that's it. So if you don't, and 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 they nuance eternal life, meaning that when you understand eternal life to be eternal life, then you understand that it can't be lost. And what they're actually saying is that if you don't have a sense of eternal security, you're not saved. And it's not until you have that that you are saved. And last year I had Dave Anderson, Doctor Dave Anderson, who's the pastor of a Faith Bible Fellowship, I think it is, or fel- what's the name of it? Faith Bible Church. Fellowship of the Woodland Faith, something like that. Um, no, it's not Fellowship of the Woodlands. It's faith, it's up in the Woodlands. But I had Dave deliver a paper, give a paper at, at the Chafer Conference last year, and the, one of the major thrusts in his paper, rather than dealing with some of the exegetical issues, was just the historical reality that the whole idea of eternal security wasn't clear in the history of the church until the Reformation. And that you go through much of the early church and they, they, they have a view that you can lose your salvation. They, they're, they're just confused. And so what his, one of his arguments was that if the position of GES today is true, then very, very few people on the order of just dozens uh, got saved for the first 1,500 years of Christianity. And that's just a historical argument, which is a valid argument in this context. Well... There have been a number of articles, questions, 
Um, if you want to read some things on this, there's uh, Duluth Bible Church up in Minnesota where Dennis Roxer's the pastor and one of the men out of that ministry named Tom Stegall has written a series of articles that are on the internet dealing with the crossless gospel and <clears throat> where he's interacting with a number of articles that have been published by Zane Hodges, John Niemela, Bob Wilkin, and others where they make these affirmations. So this has been coming to a head in a number of areas, and <clears throat> this just this last week I received the latest Grace in Focus uh, newsletter, and it's uh, the volume 23, number 2. I'm sure it's on their website because they put most of their things on the website. And in the inside of it, Bob Wilkin has written an article called, Do You Know Our View on Assurance of Salvation? And the background for this, I appreciate his clarification, is that approximately three or four years ago, they re GES revised their doctrinal statement and they posted it on their website. Now, I didn't know they had revised their doctrinal statement, and a friend of mine, Fred Librand, told me that they had, and he said you know, that he just changed it and put, put it on the website and didn't tell anybody. As far as I know, I was never informed, and they said they informed people, and I'll take them at their word, but I never knew it, and I know a lot of other people who didn't know it. And when I went back after Fred told me that last year, I looked at their website online, looked at the doctrinal statement, and realized I could no longer affirm their doctrinal statement. There were two or three modifications that had been made that I didn't think were accurate. So in this newsletter, Wilkin addresses that, and he says, quote, here is the key clarification we made. And then he quotes the statement in the affirmations. Assurance is of the essence of believing in Jesus for everlasting life. That is, as long as a person believes in Jesus for everlasting life. Not believing in, and you have to understand what he's not saying. He's not saying believing in Jesus for justification. He's not saying believing in Jesus for forgiveness of sin. He's not saying believing in Jesus for atonement or any of those things. He's saying unless a person believes in Jesus for everlasting life, that is, as long as a person believes in Jesus for everlasting life, he knows he has everlasting life. Now, in case you don't understand what he means by that, he tells us in the next paragraph. He says, in other words, until a person believes that he has received from the Lord Jesus... <clears throat> excuse me, let me... I left out a word. He says, in other words, until a person believes that what he has received from the Lord Jesus Christ is permanent and cannot be lost, whether he understands that as eternal life, salvation, or living forever. See, the term salvation there, he, he throws that in. That's just a... That could mean anything to anybody. And that... Um, that what he has received from the Lord Jesus is permanent and cannot be lost, whether he understands that as eternal life, salvation, or living forever with him in his kingdom, he is not yet born again. Now see, there are vast numbers of churches and denominations that believe, that will teach that Jesus died for your sins, but you can lose your salvation. Now what he is saying is none of those people are saved. Now he makes a a, log a illogical uh, shift in the next part of the article. Because what we are saying is that a person can believe Jesus died for their sins, but they may not understand eternal security. I don't think I did when I was six years old. And by, by trying to make this as uh, uh, just if salvation, if you believe you're getting saved, then you, you, know, you, you understand eternal security. That's just poor verbiage. Um, what he's saying is until you understand that you have eternal life and that it can't be lost, you're not saved. And so once again, there it seems to me they're adding something to the gospel. And he gives a, a couple of illustrations of what he means, and then a couple of paragraphs later, I see a serious shift in logic, a real logical fallacy. He shifts the terms. The terms are not about religion, being a religious Christian. There are a lot of people who are religious and have a pseudo-Christianity. You have all kinds of, of different denominations and people in state church countries that say they're Christians and they don't understand the gospel at all. 
We're not talking about people who are just overtly religious. We're talking about people who understand that Jesus died for their sins, but they may not understand eternal security. So he says, of course, this is in some ways a radical doctrine today. It means that there are lots of very religious Christians who are unregenerate and who need to be born again. Now, the issue isn't about very religious Christians. It's about Christians who believe Jesus died for their sins, but they haven't understood eternal security. That doesn't necessarily put you in the category of a religious Christian who is not a, who really doesn't understand the gospel. So there's a a logical fallacy there. And he reiterates this in the next paragraph. He says, this wasn't a radical thought in the early 70s when I came to faith. At that time, everyone I knew who was involved in Campus Crusade was concerned for and witnessed to Roman Catholics, Eastern Orthodox, and all flavors of Protestants. We never assumed that because someone was religious or a member of a church that they were born again. Well, that's an accurate statement. I never assume that just because somebody's part of a religious, has a lot of religious activity in their life, that they're truly regenerate. But that's not the subject of the doctrinal statement. The way he should say, say that is we never assume that because someone didn't believe in eternal security that they weren't born again. That's what they're talking about. So he shifts the whole terms of the argument in the, in the latter part of, of this particular newsletter. So, and the interesting thing is, that in, in this article, just to show, Bob had, was a debater in college, so he really knows what he's doing debate-wise. And he mentions two people in the article, and both people he mentioned in the article, Fred Librand, who's pastor of Northeast Bible Church, and Hugh Crowder, who is a pastor in the, a doctrinal pastor in the uh, Seattle area. Neither of those two men believe this doctrinal statement that they have shifted to. But he quotes them in other contexts as if that affirms his view. So um, I had read that a few months ago and just due to procrastination had not uh, removed the, ch uh, uh, the church from membership from being on their website. And so I took that action this afternoon. So that <clears throat> brings us up with some little contemporary uh, things that are going on. And this is a, uh, it's really sad to watch this because it's going to have a lot of long range consequences for a lot of different people. And this is an organization that has done, uh, has had a great impact for a lot of years, but they are majoring in a very minor uh, hermeneutical decision that they have made, and they want everybody within the organization to affirm their little gnat's hair. And in, in organizations that go through things where you have a doctrinal change, there should be a procedure where there is a, a lengthy period of time, more than four or five years. Of course, they would say that, that they have held this view for uh, decades, and actually many of us who've researched this and gone back, and a year ago I took uh, several of Zane Hodge's books with me when I went to Kiev and read through them and realized that he'd been... He had been stating the gospel this way for a long time, over 20 years. You could see it in his first book. But he never really came out and said this is, it wasn't in black and white. It wasn't clear that, well, this is all there is to the gospel. If you don't believe in eternal security, you're not saved. But he had always had articulated the gospel in this way of believing in Jesus, accepting the gift of eternal life from Jesus, believing in Christ for eternal life. He had always expressed it that way. And in and of itself, that just doesn't sound wrong. Your, your radar is not going to go off. It's not until you get in the context of a distortion and you hear someone clarify something the way uh, Bob Wilkin did in that article, that suddenly you begin to read that phrase in a different light. And that's what happens in all through church history. Those who are coming to the History of Doctrine class on Monday night are seeing that, that one of the things that happens throughout the course of church history is that when error comes, often it is not... Uh, clearly seen and understood as to just why it is wrong for a while. And most people at first don't want to say it's wrong because there's a tendency to want to avoid conflict and division. But sooner or later, people begin to see what the, 
what is truly and actually being said, and then you have to make an issue out of it, and it's unfortunate that we do. So I just thought I would enlighten you on these these issues. Now let's get back into our text in uh, Ezekiel. Ezekiel chapter 36, where we are continuing our study on the New Covenant. And just to remind you of what we were doing last week, I emphasize the fact that <clears throat> in Ezekiel 36 we have... Once again, a clear statement on the nature of the, <clears throat> of the new covenant. And it's very important for us to understand this. I know it, it seems to me sometimes like, well, am I just boring everybody to death going through all these passages and taking forever to look at all these facets of the new covenant that are in the, in the Old Testament. But it's so crucial to do this because there are things that are, just aren't clear and we read in numerous works by good men, good theologians who are dispensationalists, and it's and in three sentences or, or two paragraphs they explain the new covenant, and you and they'll cite the these verses as references, and you go back and you read them and you begin to ask some questions and need some clarification, see how things are put together. And one of the things I pointed out last time in Ezekiel thirty six is that at the core passage which begins in verse 25, God says that at the time the covenant is enacted, the time that it is enacted, uh, He is going to cleanse Israel. He will sprinkle clean water on you, plural, and you, plural, will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your filthiness and from all your idols. And He uses a word for cleansing that relates to ceremonial or ritual cleansing. We'll look at these words a little bit in a chart I have. Uh, this is the Hebrew word taher, T-A-H-E-R, and it is used predominantly for ritual or ceremonial cleansing. That is, when, you, when someone is going to go to the temple to worship, come before God, and under the Levitical laws, uh, the Mosaic laws, that in order to come into God's presence, they must be cleansed of ritual uh, impurity, so that if a woman gives birth, then she has to be cleansed uh, seven days later, or eight days later, she has to go through the proper cleansing ritual and sacrifices. And same things if you touch a dead body, then you have to wait so many days, and there has to be a, you know, go through a cleansing ritual. These are not sins, but they... There's elements in both of these. For example, the giving of birth for a woman is now in pain and suffering because of the curse. And so there's something about giving birth that is that is different because of the judgment on sin. So it's used as a as a uh, a picture uh, <coughs> to as a uh, of sin and what has to happen because of sin. Same thing with touching a dead body. The reason there's physical death is because of sin. It's a reminder of the curse, and so there's ceremonial cleansing that has to take place. But these things are not sin in and of themselves. So the whole idea of cleansing isn't related to confession of sin and forgiveness of sins. These are two different things. If you're out in the fields up in the Galilee, and you are... um, you're working out in the fields and you're living your life and you commit sin, then you can confess your sin to God like David did in Psalm 51 and have forgiveness. But when you go into the temple, if you have uh, committed any acts that render you ceremonially or ritually unclean, then you have to be cleansed of those sins with a sacrifice, which is a picture of a spiritual reality. What I'm arguing here is this cleansing terminology that is in this chapter, and it will be made so clear to you when we get into Ezekiel 37, that this cleansing takes place nationally at the time of the second advent when Jesus Christ sets up his kingdom because he's going to reestablish his physical presence on the earth in in the millennial temple. And because there, once again, will be a physical reality, a physical presence of God on the earth, then we go back to certain ceremonial ritual cleansing that must take place. First, the nation has to be cleansed after all the war and everything that takes place during the tribulation period. There has to be a cleansing because of their past history of idolatry and their rejection of Jesus as Messiah. So it's a national uh, cleansing. 
Then what goes beyond that, in addition to that, God says, moreover, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. And the way that's punctuated in the English, you have a, that a semicolon ending that that's the end of one independent clause. And you have two things that are stated there. And this is, I believe, a topical sentence and should be punctuated as a topical sentence. He, and it's and what God is saying is, I'm going to do two things for you. One involves a new heart and one involves a new spirit. Then the second sentence, which should begin with the uh, second half of verse 26, and I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. See, that relates to the giving of the new heart. So he's saying is, I'm going to do two things for you, A and B. The next sentence describes more fully what he says as how he's going to do A. And then the third sentence is going to tell you more about how he's going to do B. And if that's true, then that means that the... S in spirit in the topical sentence isn't a lowercase s, it's an uppercase s, because the key of this whole thing is God puts put his spirit into uh, every Jewish uh, person in the under the new covenant. So I pointed this out last time that the new spirit here is not a reference to the human spirit, which would be re- simple regeneration. It is talking about something beyond that, in terms of the personal indwelling of the Holy Spirit in every Jew in the millennial period, and it has features associated with it that go far beyond the features that we see in the church related to the indwelling of the Holy Spirit in the church age. It has a different purpose and different manifestation. This is why in Joel 2, when Joel says that he'll pour out his spirit, God says he'll pour out his spirit upon Israel after, after, the, after these days, um, the, after the tribulation, and the young men see dreams, the old men prophesy, your, or see visions, and the, your daughters prophesy. All of this man, is this different manifestation that occurs in the spiritual life of the Jewish believer in the church age. So that means that we should uh, translate this differently, and it results in a radical transformation of the spiritual life. Verse 27, I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes. And I pointed out last time, and this is so crucial, pointed out last time that if this took place in 33 AD on the day of Pentecost, if this is, if the new covenant was enacted in 33, then this would mean that If you're truly regenerate, then you can't be you can't apostatize the faith. And see, that is the core principle in lordship salvation and the fifth P in the Calvinistic system of Tulip, the perseverance of the saints. That the person is truly regenerate cannot uh, cannot fully apostatize and deny Christ as as savior. And so. The reason I point that out is because in both amillennial systems of interpretation and in the uh, neo-dispensational view of progressive dispensationalism, they want Joel 2, the quotation of Joel 2 and Acts 2, when Peter says, this is what the prophet Joel spoke of, they want that to mean that we are now living under an enacted new covenant. It's only partial, but it's here. That's why theology makes a difference. If that's true, then all of the charismatic gifts should still be in operation because your your young men should see visions and your old men dream dreams and daughters prophesy and everything in Joel 2 should be happening today. And what I'm saying is that no, we should not understand Joel 2 to be enacted in Acts 2. All Peter is saying is what's happening now, the coming of the Holy Spirit, the speaking in languages that these men didn't learn, that is just a manifestation of the Spirit that is like that of what will happen uh, when Joel 2 is fulfilled. So, the key to understand this is the whole concept of cleansing. Let me go to, uh, and so we're going to have two things happen. A new heart will take place where their heart is changed, the deceptive heart, Jeremiah said, your heart is deceitful and wicked above all things who can know it, is changed. 
And see, I remember a few years ago, I read an article by a classmate of mine when I was in a doctoral program at Dallas who was critiquing an old debate that in, in 1918, Lewis Berry Chafer wrote a book called He That is Spiritual. And at the time, one of the greatest Reformed theologians, Calvinistic theologians at Princeton Seminary was Benjamin Breckenridge Warfield. And Warfield had some great things to say, and he's worth reading in certain areas, but Warfield just took Chafer to task for that book. And uh, I think in some ways he misunderstood him. But this article that this friend of mine wrote um, criticized Chafer. And this is such a telling comment. At the end of the article, he says, the weakness with Chafer was that he had a low view of regeneration. He did not realize that at regeneration, the sin nature is changed. And that's, that, is, that is classic. That, that, and that kind of thinking is what comes out of this. Uh, not being able to rightly understand what's happening with the new covenant and that it doesn't come into effect until the second coming. And so it affects how people teach the spiritual life. And it's, a, it's no wonder people get confused. You turn on your radio now, and it used to be in the old days, KHCB was always solid, and, and they always had men who always taught basically the same Chaferian theology. And now you have different people from R.C. Sproul to uh, John MacArthur and to others who teach different views of sanctification. And people, the average person in the pew doesn't know that there are about eight different models of sanctification, and they don't know that, the, that John MacArthur teaches out of one view, and R.C. Sproul teaches another view, and Chuck Swindoll teaches another view. And, and so they listen to these people as if they're all teaching the same ideas on the spiritual life, and they're not. And they go home, and they're a little confused. And then if they continue to listen for long, they begin to think, well, if these guys can't figure it out, how can I be expected to figure it out? I'm just going to go down and, and feel good at Lakewood and, and everything will be okay and I don't have to worry about thinking about the Christian life. And you laugh, but there are people who are at Lakewood who are there for that very reason. is because people just think that, well, if all these scholars who know Greek and Hebrew can't figure it out, then I can't figure it out. So I'm just going to quit trying to think. So the key issue in here is understanding ritual cleansing on externally, which is what the first part is about, that I will sprinkle clean water on you and you will be clean. And then verses 26 to 27 talk about the inner transformation that will occur for every, uh, every Jewish believer in the millennial kingdom. So let's talk a little bit about this whole concept of cleansing. This is so important to understand, and it's going to be good... It's good background for us right now because when we finish Hebrews 8 and the New Covenant, when we get into Hebrews 9 and Hebrews 10, those chapters are, are built on an understanding of the ritual system in the tabernacle and temple and the Levitical sacrifices and offerings. And so we're going to have to spend a lot of time in the Old Testament to understand the backdrop, backdrop for Hebrews 9 and 10 uh, we may not understand it as well as the original recipients of Hebrews understood it, but we have to understand it so that these chapters even make sense to us because the writer's assuming that, uh, that you understand it. So the first word is cleansing. And cleansing is the Hebrew word taher, and it always refers to ritual cleansing, ceremonial cleansing, and it's not the same as inner spiritual cleansing or transformation. And it is contrasted with the word tame, T-A-M-E, which uh, is translated in the Greek with the word akatharsia, from, uh, which has to do with that which is unclean. Katharizo is the Greek verb you've heard me talk about before that is the verb for cleansing. And uh, when you put the alpha privative in front of it, it's like putting you in the English U-N in front of it. It negates the word. So it's translated with being unclean, or sometimes the Greek word miaino, which has to do with being defiled. These are ceremonial terms, ritual terms. They are not talking about sin uh, <clears throat> per se. So we have to understand that particular word group. And as I pointed out last time, as we got into the introduction to Ezekiel 36, I pointed out that earlier in the chapter, there was a contrast between holy and profane. 
And I believe that started in about verse 21, when God's, or verse 20, when they came to the nations, wherever they went, they profaned my holy name. God is a speaker here. When they said to them, these are the people of the Lord, and yet they have gone out of his land, but I had concern for my holy name, which the house of Israel had profaned among the nations where they went. The word profane uh, doesn't mean you're uh, uttering certain curse words. It means that which is common. And it's contrasted to holy, which means that which is set apart or distinct. Now, these are the, the two opposite terms. So you have on the one side, holy and profane, and see, the, the, the priest is holy because he's been consecrated and set apart to the service of God. The people are common or profane. That doesn't mean that they are, that's not a derogatory term. It's just they haven't gone through that process of being set apart ceremonially or ritually. It does, neither of those terms in most contexts has to do with whether or not a person is saved or unsaved. So a priest is holy because he's been set apart to God, and he can commit certain acts which render him ceremonially unclean. So he can be holy and unclean, and when he performs the ritual, he can be holy and clean. But he can be holy and clean and unsaved, because the only requirement for being a priest is genetic relationship to Aaron and the tribe of Levi. And if you read through all the qualifications for a priest, it never once talks about his spiritual life or the fact that he trusts in God. It has to do with the fact that he is a uh, simply in that genetic relationship. And I, would, I wouldn't be surprised if the two sons of, of Eli, Eli was a high priest at the time of Samuel, in the first part of the book of Samuel, his two sons were Phinehas and Hophni, and they were rebellious, and they uh, uh, used the sacrificial system to rob the people, and there's nothing good said of them, and it's very likely they were not saved. So here you'd have uh, two cases of priests who aren't saved, but they're holy and they could be holy and clean. So we have to understand that this terminology is related to ritual terminology and it's not related to uh, eternal soteriological uh, conditions. A place in the Old Testament where you see these words used together is in Leviticus 10, 9 through 11. I want you to turn with me to Leviticus chapter 10. I'm going to cross-reference a couple of passages, and then we'll go back and look at the events of Leviticus chapter 10. <clears throat> Leviticus 10, do not drink wine or strong drink. God is addressing the uh, requirements for, uh, for the uh, priesthood. Don't drink wine or strong drink. Neither you nor your sons with you when you come into the tent of meeting, meeting so that you will not die. In other words, if you profane the holy of holies, there's a death penalty, which is what had just happened to two of Aaron's sons. God says it's a perpetual statute throughout your generation, and so as to make a distinction, see the priesthood, the priests were to teach this distinction between the holy and the profane, and between the unclean and the clean. And I've highlighted that verse because if you read it in Leviticus 10, it looks as if holy and profane, that word group, and unclean and clean, that second word group, that those two word groups are synonymous, but they're not. I'll show you why in just a minute. But the role of the priesthood, according to verse 11, was to teach the sons of Israel all the statutes which God had spoken. Their role was to teach the law to the people, part of which was the distinction between holy and profane on the one hand and unclean and clean on the other hand. And we see that in Ezekiel twenty two twenty six. And there it's very clear from the grammar these are two separate categories. The, her priests have done violence to my law, God says. This is his indictment of the priesthood and why Israel was going out under the fifth cycle of discipline. Her priests have done violence to my law and have profaned my holy things. They have made no distinction between the holy and the profane. And they have not taught the difference between the unclean and the clean. So this, the way the grammar is structured, these are two separate uh, categories. And they hide their eyes from my Sabbaths, and I am profaned among them. And then there, <clears throat> so we have a chart here that I've developed to try to show this. The difference between holy and clean. 
Holy means to be set apart. So the priests were set apart in the service of God at the beginning of their service. There, for the high priest, there was a complete bath that took place, which indicates or is a type of the complete positional cleansing of the believer at the instant of salvation. He is set apart, therefore, to the service of God. That's the key idea in holiness. It doesn't mean being morally pure or perfect or righteous. It means to be set apart to the service of a God. That's the core semantic meaning. When it's applied here is they are set apart to the service of of the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Uh, The temple itself is holy. The furniture is holy. So furniture can't be moral or immoral. Those qualities just can't fit a piece of furniture, a piece of metal. You can't say that at the uh, lampstand or the or the clothing of the priest is morally pure. It doesn't have moral qualities, but it is set apart to God. Now, when it is violated in terms of ritual law, then it becomes profaned. And that word means common. The people are profane. Uh, everyday utensils are profane until they are ritually purified for the service of God. They are uh, profane. So you have these two categories on one side. Then on the other side, we have the word clean, that which is uh, cleansed ritually can enter into the temple and can be brought into the uh, presence of God. And this is contrasted with that which is unclean or defiled. Uh, <coughs> our words uh, that we've seen already, this means it's ritually unclean. It does not equal sin. I, I think too many people read Leviticus or, or Exodus or Leviticus, and when they read clean and unclean, what they think of is sin and not sin. Uh, This is a physical uh, feature. So again, in Ezekiel, the last verse we looked at in Ezekiel was Ezekiel 22 and 26, which precedes uh, Ezekiel 36 and 37, talking about the new covenant. And now Ezekiel 44, 23, where again, this is talking about the future temple, And the priesthood in the future temple, the millennial temple, they shall teach my people the difference between the holy and the profane and cause them to discern between the unclean and the clean. And that's going to be happening during the the millennial kingdom. All right, so we understand these particular particular features. Now, I had you turn to Leviticus chapter 10. And this is the episode of a of a priestly rebellion that took place at the time that the temple is being uh, dedicated. And in previous chapters, for example, if you just just sort of page your way through, you have the the first seven chapters of, of, uh, of Leviticus, the different laws of the different offerings. We'll come back and look at those as we get into the next chapter in Hebrews. Then in chapter 8, Aaron and his sons are consecrated. This is when the high priest would take his full bath and as, as a washing, indicating complete cleansing from sin. And so he is consecrated. This was uh, also associated with various other offerings, indicating that he is set apart to the service of God. The word consecration is, uh, comes out of another word within the Kadash Word group. Kadash is the Hebrew word for holy, just as hagias is the uh, basic Greek noun for holy. And you have various forms of that root word which indicate consecration, sanctification, um, holiness, these these ideas. Then if we read at chapter 9, the first verse of Leviticus 9, it came to pass on the eighth day that Moses called Aaron and his sons and the elders of Israel. And he said to Aaron, Take for yourself a young bull as a sin offering and a ram as a burnt offering without blemish and offer them before the Lord and the children of Israel. Uh, and to the children of Israel you shall speak and give various instructions to them. So this sets the stage as this is the eighth day after the consecration of the priesthood. And then just skip over to... 
the end of that chapter, verse 23, I'm just setting some chronology here for you. And Moses and Aaron went into the tabernacle of meeting and came out and blessed the people. Then the glory of the Lord appeared to all the people. So this is when you have the Shekinah glory coming in and taking up residence in the Holy of Holies in the in the tabernacle. And fire came out from before the Lord and consumed the burnt offering and the fat on the altar. When all the people saw it, they shouted and fell on their faces. Just an incredible scene before all of Israel this occurs. Then something happens. The first verse of the next chapter is not some later time. This is just talking about the, still the events of that day. Then Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, each took his censer and put fire in it, put incense in it, and offered profane fire before the Lord. See, this came from a source that had not been consecrated. So it's not holy. So they're going to offer uh, unauthorized fire. It hasn't been, clean, uh, been sanctified yet. It hasn't become holy. So they offer profane fire before the Lord, which he had not commanded them. Great example of what happens when people start trying to invent an, their own ideas of what gives them uh, a relationship with God. You can't make up the rules on your own. You have to let God make up the rules and follow his rules. So they are going to offer profane fire before the Lord. So fire went out from the Lord and devoured them. And I mean, they are just incinerated on the spot. What an object lesson. That's that harsh, evil God of the Old Testament, the liberals like to say. Well, God's making, a, you know, teaching the importance of his justice and righteousness, and you can't come before God in an unauthorized manner. There's only one way, and that's God's way. So fire went out from the Lord, devoured them. They died before the Lord. And Moses said to Aaron, this is what the Lord spoke, saying, by those who come near me, I must be regarded as holy, and before all the people, I must be glorified. Now, I'm sure there was a lot more that went on. We're just given the uh, Holy Spirit's uh, abridged version of the events that day, but I'm sure this had quite an impact on everyone. And this is the context of the verses that I just said, where Aaron is reminded that the role of the, of the priesthood is to distinguish between holy and unholy and be between unclean and clean, down in verse 10, that you may teach the children of Israel all the statutes which the Lord has spoken to them by the hand of Moses. Now, <clears throat> now I want you to just stop there, and we're going to go through a, ver a, a whole lot of laws that are going to be developed in the following uh, sections. You have, starting in verse 12, references to various uh, gr the grain offering, wave offering, heave offering, wave offering. This isn't a wave offering, just... Want to make sure y'all understood that? I've been in churches where they've done that. Don't laugh. Let's all give a wave offering to the Lord and they'll wave. You just want to make sure y'all will awake. Okay, it's not a basketball game. You got a wave offering, peace offering, heave offering, uh, sin offering. We'll go through all of those as we go through Hebrews. Then in chapter 11, you get into dietary laws. The things you can eat and the things you can't eat, that some animals are clean and some are not clean. And it doesn't have anything to do with health. You can't go out and pick up one of these diet books. It says that this is the, you know, the biblical diet, and there's a bunch of them out there, trust me. And so you can't eat shrimp and you can't eat catfish and you can't eat crawdads or crawfish or anything like that because that's not on the mosaic law. This didn't have anything to do with health. It had to do with that most of the shellfish are scavengers they eat dead things. Why do you have dead things? You have dead things because of the curse of Genesis 3. And so anything associated with death renders you ceremonially unclean. And that which uh, eats certain other things that's not, uh, th these animals aren't scavengers, don't touch dead things, are not involved with dead things, that, that you're okay. In Acts chapter 10, when God authorized uh, Peter and the church to do away with the, the dietary laws, it wasn't because Peter had finally discovered that you have to cook pork at a certain temperature to avoid trichinosis, or that they had suddenly discovered how to properly cook shellfish so you wouldn't get any diseases. 
They had, you know, it had nothing to do with that. It had to do with what God was teaching as a, a through the sacrificial system and through the dietary laws as a training aid, as a visual, physical image of the impact of sin. So chapter 11 in Leviticus talks about the dietary laws, and then you have various other laws in chapter 12 and chapter 13 that talk about what renders you clean and unclean. And if you just go through here, and, and I've done this in, in these chapters, underline every use of the word clean or unclean, that's what these chapters are all about. Now, what started this? This is why you have to do the big picture in Bible study. You can't just say, okay, let's, let's hone in on three verses and spend six weeks on it because you lose the context and you have to have the flow. The, the priests are consecrated. Seven days later, God moves in to the, to the temple. On the same day that God moves in at, into the temple and you have his Shekinah glory and he consumes the offering, then you have two of Aaron's sons violate the sanctity. That's another word that comes from these word groups for holy and consecrated and sanctification. They violate the sanctity of the holy of holies by taking profane fire in. Then God rebukes Aaron and says the role of the priest is to teach people the difference between the holy and profane and clean and unclean. And then he proceeds to give instructions on what makes you clean and unclean, and that covers the rest of chapter uh, 10 and chapter 11 and chapter 12, where you have a woman is unclean at childbirth, and then chapter 13, which is, which is leprosy and dealing with things related to that, and the, chapter 14, the ritual for the cleansing of a leper. Uh, the last part of that chapter deals with uh, cleaning, the, the ritual cleansing of a house, uh, that where a leper has been, and then chapter 15, you have various other types of cleansing, and then you come to chapter 16. Everything from the second half of chapter 10 through chapter 15 talks about what makes you clean and unclean. Then, chapter 16, verse 1 reads, Now the Lord spoke to Moses after the death of the two sons of Aaron. Now, it probably took you in your morning Bible reading a week to get through those five chapters because they're boring and you don't like reading all those lists. And people forget that ch chapter 16, verse 1, takes place right after the death of Abihu, uh, Nadab and Abihu. And he says, Now the Lord spoke to Moses after the death of the two sons of Aaron when they offered profane fire before the Lord and died. And the Lord said to Moses... Tell Aaron your brother not to come at just any time into the holy place inside the veil before the mercy seat, which is on the ark, lest he die, for I will appear in the cloud above the mercy seat. Thus Aaron shall come into the holy place with the blood of a young bull as a sin offering and of a ram as a burnt offering. And then it describes how he shall dress, and it goes through all of this. And this is the description of what is he is to do once a year on the Day of Atonement. So Leviticus 16 describes the Day of Atonement in the context of what have we been talking about for five chapters? Cleansing. Now the interesting thing is that you and I were mostly taught that the word atonement, the Hebrew word kafar, means uh, um, covering, which isn't bad, but it's probably not right. And I've been uh, there, there's been a lot of discussion among Hebrew scholars on the meaning of that word the last 20 years or so, and many of, of them believe that the core semantic meaning of kafar has to do with cleansing. It is a picture of ritual cleansing, of guilt. But it is a picture, it's a ritual cleansing. And this is backed up by the fact that probably about 60 or 70% of the time that the word kafar is translated into the Greek Septuagint, it's translated with, with a word related to uh, catharsis or katharizo, which means cleansing. And so the idea of a t the Day of Atonement isn't primarily focusing on phase one salvation justification, but the ongoing cleansing of the nation from year to year because the blood of the bulls and goats can't permanently take away sin. We'll get into that in Hebrews 10. So we tie all these things together and we're hit with an understanding that what, what Ezekiel is talking about 
when he talks about the new covenant being a covenant for cleansing, is that this has to do with the ritual cleansing of the nation because of their past sins in preparation for the present dwelling of Jesus Christ physically in their midst in the millennial temple. So that wraps up what I want to cover on Ezekiel 36, and the next time we'll come back and we'll get into Ezekiel 37 and go through that section, which won't involve a whole lot. Most of what I've said is already um, covered there. We'll just summarize that, go look at two other uh, key or three other key passages in the Old Testament, and then we'll get into New Testament uh, passages on the New Covenant. Let's uh, close in prayer. Father, thank you for this understanding of these things in your word and a greater clarity of what will happen in the uh, time when the new covenant is established, when uh, you bring your people, Israel, back to the land to establish them as a, as a, as a nation, a regenerate nation composed of regenerate individuals who are trusting in you and what you will do to them in that, under that covenant as a fulfillment ultimately of what you promised to Abraham. Father, challenge us with our own role in this as we begin to understand these dynamics. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen.